All right, so welcome everyone, and thank you for participating in this year's nonprofit conference. This feels a little weird. I'm used to uh, uh, being in a room with all of you people as opposed to doing this thing um, on a virtual basis. Um, I enjoyed the time we spent together. Um, hopefully, everybody kind of started getting the, uh, the whole gist of how that networking worked. Um, we're going to have uh, the ability for people to network throughout the day. Uh, so if anybody uh, doesn't want to sit through one of the sessions and they want to network with other people, uh, they can. Uh, there's there's different buttons across the left side of your screen. You have your microphone button. You have your camera button. Um, the fourth one down, you see a bunch of little people there. That's your people button. So you can kind of see who's um, involved in this session so that you can um, look to connect with anybody that you want to connect with. Um, so if there's people that you want to talk to, feel free to kind of connect with them and, and have some time to, to talk with them. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the speed networking was good, but again, I think, uh, some people were just not fully getting it. So, um, just play with a little bit, you know, take some time a little later. I know it between 1030 and 1045, we have the ability for a little bit more of that speed networking. Uh, it really is uh, a cool concept and you get to meet some really cool people here. Um, it's funny, one of my partners asked me last week uh, how long we've been doing this nonprofit uh, update. And I went back and I was able to trace it back to at least 15 years. So we've been doing this for more than 15 years. Uh, and uh, I'm sure it's a lot longer than that. The important part of this is that, um, you know, we, we kind of continue to look for ways that we can provide information, answers to our nonprofit and clients and friends. And that's what the purpose of this thing is. Um, because we're virtual this year, we're able to do things a little different than we've done in the past. So as you can see from the uh, agenda for today, we have uh, different sessions. So we have a, a room A, a room B, and a room C. So the room A is, we're going to call that our um, CARES Act room. That's going to be a little more technical. So you're going to have an accounting update, a legal update with uh, David Goldstein, and then the impact of the CARES Act on HR, um, and that's with Ed Probst and Jennifer Kenny uh, and uh, uh, Maggie. So that's the uh, the A track. And then the B track is going to be more of the virtual office track. And there you can see that we have virtual software with Rob Johns uh, Johnson. We have the IT concerns of going virtual with Shari and Kevin, and then virtual fundraising with Darren Port. Um, we do have a nonprofit panel. It's a great nonprofit panel this afternoon where people can ask questions. I'll be functioning as the moderator for that. And then we have a Q&A panel uh, at the end of the day or if people have questions that we didn't get to over the course of the day, uh, we'll try to answer them during that Q&A panel, but bring questions. Um, if, if you uh, want, you can uh, chat, as a lot of you have already been doing, and, and put some stuff through chat. There's also, to the right of your screen, a Q&A. And in that Q&A, you can ask questions uh, to the speakers throughout the course of the day, and we'll try to get to as many of them as, as we possibly can. Uh, this is new for all of us. This is not something that... Uh, We've, we've done before in a, in a virtual um, sort of way. So uh, there might be some bugs, might be some kinks. I apologize for all of that up front. Um, but, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we'll be able to, to kind of handle that. <clears throat> a couple other things uh, to keep in mind. Um, all of the PowerPoint presentations for today were all emailed to you, so you should have them. In addition, um, what we're going to do is as you go into each session, um, the PowerPoints will be posted in the chat, so you can also click on it within the chat and get a copy of the PowerPoint that way if you don't have it from the uh, email that was sent to you. Um, we also emailed you a software guide in terms of how to use this. The program that we're using is something called Excel Events. Um, it's actually the same platform we're going to be using for the Imagine Awards, uh, which is going to happen on July 8th. You'll hear me mention that a few times today. Um, so uh, if anybody's having any problems, um, they can either uh, post a question in the, the chat, and uh, we have several people here who will help you through those problems. Or if you want, you can call our office, 631-582-1600, um, and we'll help you navigate through the system if anybody's having difficulties. Again, our goal here is, um, while we would love to be in person, we want to make sure that you get the most out of this seminar as possible. Um, also. Um, at the end of this, we're going to ask everybody to fill out an evaluation form. That's specifically or, or especially important for anyone who is looking for CPE credits. Because again, if you're looking for CPE credits, uh, you get up to three um, CPE hours for accounting. 
uh, today if, if you want it. Um, so make sure you fill out that evaluation form. A um, couple other things. Um, everybody should have um, registered for the various classes that they want to go into. Um, you don't necessarily have to register for um, every single class or register for what you're going to in order to be able to. If you have registered, um, you'll be prompted at the time that the, the time for the uh, event comes up. Uh, and just to be under, uh, so everybody understands, I apologize, but at the end of each uh, event that's scheduled, there'll be a hard stop. So at 9.10, this turns off, and then you'll be prompted to go to the keynote speaker at 9.10. Um, if you didn't register, then you just have to go back into the lobby. And when you go back into the lobby, you can kind of click on, there'll be a little join button, and you can click on through the lobby and uh, be able to get into the, um, the next session through the lobby. Again, if you don't want to go to any sessions and you'd prefer to just network, um, we do have the ability for you to continue to network throughout the course of the day uh, to catch up with some people that maybe you haven't spoken to in a while. So I, I, uh, I want to, again, once again, thank everybody for um, participating in today, uh, today's event. Uh, hopefully there's a lot of good information that you'll get from this and a lot that you'll learn. Um, again, we tried to, to bring in a whole bunch of different speakers, and because, again, we're doing this virtually, we have the opportunity to have a lot more speakers, a lot more options for you. Um, feel free to jump in and out over the course of the day if there's something you want to be involved in or, or hear. You can listen to it, um, and then if you want to kind of get out uh, and do something else over the course of the day, you can do it and hop back into those sessions that you want to be in. And again, feel free to network. Um, I. One of the other things that we have that I think is, is kind of cool and special today is we do have a keynote speaker, Michelle Jackson. So I'd, I'd like to introduce, before we get into her session, I'd like to introduce her. Um, Michelle Jackson is the new executive director of the Human Service Council. I'm really, really happy to have Michelle because she's been overseeing the COVID-19 response within the human service sector since the pandemic started. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the last four months, she has been coordinating with government and other uh, external partners to ensure the human service providers are equipped to address the profound social, economic, and public health challenges facing communities and the human service workforce. So again, she's uh, she's been on the front line um, during this whole time, uh, making sure that she understands the impact on the nonprofit sector um, for the um, uh, and, and how it's impacted the, the social service organizations. So again, we were very, very happy when Michelle said that she would be um, joining us today as a um, keynote speaker. So what we're gonna do now is if everybody can kind of head over to the um, keynote speaker session. So again, either you'll be prompted to join or you have to go over to the lobby and, uh, and join that way. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for coming. Enjoy our, our conference today, and uh, welcome. Good morning, everyone. I'm Michelle Jackson. I'm the Executive Director of the Human Services Council. Thanks so much for, for joining this morning. And I really want to thank Serena and Associates for asking me to join you all today, and also for holding this conference at a really important time. Um, you know, with the city budget passing and New York reopening, I think having a moment for so many nonprofit uh, and people in the nonprofit world to come together is so important. So thank you all for, for planning um, this, um, this session for everyone today to come together. Uh, and obviously I used to worry about like tripping on my way to the podium and now I have to just make sure <laughs> that I hit all the right buttons and do everything correctly. Um, so it's a new world. Uh, and also thanks to Serena and Associates for helping charter this, this world with us because we'll certainly steal what you all learn from your conference uh, in terms of technology. So for people who aren't familiar with the Human Services Council, we represent about 170 human services organizations in New York City. And we do city and state policy on behalf of the sector uh, and really, we our members range from child care organizations to senior services and everything in between. So we really have the full spectrum of human services under our umbrella, as well as a lot of the New York City based coalition groups um, who help uh, who also, you know, like Homeless Services United, um, FPWA, Catholic Charities. So we work with those coalitions as well um, to kind of delve into what are the critical issues that human services nonprofits face. And 
Uh, we also have a disaster preparedness group. HSE has historically done disaster work uh, in conjunction with the city and uh, with the sector itself, human services organizations. There are some who are disaster preparing entities like the Red Cross and Salvation Army. And then most nonprofits become disaster serving entities when there is a localized disaster. We saw that after Hurricane Sandy, where organizations become homeless shelters or food distribution points. Uh, they also just help out when the power was out. Um, if you had a childcare center in a NYCHA facility, you were handing out water and knocking on doors. And I'll talk today about also the, the sector's impact after COVID, uh, because not only do we serve after a disaster, but we also are impacted by disasters ourselves. So HSC does a lot of work in that area to make sure that government and nonprofits coordinate, <laughs> ideally, um, together, and that nonprofits are part of the government's disaster planning efforts. And that uh, on the flip side, that human services organizations are ready to respond after a disaster. And we have a lot more information about that. Uh, if you feel like you don't have a continuity of operation plan or a disaster plan, uh, that's some information you can find on our website um, about how to make sure that you're doing that. Because especially with COVID uh, and a second wave, which I don't mean to <laughs> be a Debbie Downer, but I imagine there will be one. Um, you know, if you haven't, if you feel unprepared for a second wave, now's the time to really um, be focusing on that. So I thought it was important. I know I'm among nonprofit friends, but uh, I think we forget sometimes the breadth and scope of the nonprofit sector. Nonprofits, which isn't just human services, but is also arts and cultures and educational institutions. Uh, we are the largest employer in New York state. We have 1.3 million jobs uh, in New York. It's we're the largest private workforce with almost 20% of the workforce. We produce 260 billion in annual revenue and foundations contribute $10 billion to New York's economy. Nationally, the, so when we look at the national scope of the nonprofit sector, we're larger than the airline industry. Uh, and I think that these facts are really important because we still are viewed as like a charitable sector, which isn't my favorite term. Um, and I think people often think that our work is really volunteer driven um, and small in scale. And the reality is that as New York's largest employer, um, and that's 1.3 million jobs and human services make up about uh, 800,000 of those jobs. We're a really significant force uh, in New York in terms of um, what we contribute to the economy, how many people we employ, and that doesn't even begin to cover the scope of how many lives we touch every day with the services that we provide. And I think it's important for us to remember how strong we are and how much we contribute. Because if you think about if we're larger than the airline industry nationally, we're certainly not treated like the airline industry. And a lot of HSC's work is improving the relationship between and the partnership between government and nonprofits and to make sure that nonprofits have the tools that they need to be um, effective in delivering quality services to communities. And I think we've seen with this COVID response that our government partners have been slow to respond, if at all, um, and that we're not seeing the same attention paid to the human services sector as we are seeing to small businesses uh, and other types of industries. And that's something that HSC works to change. And I think COVID presents new opportunities uh, for us to have those conversations. So going into COVID, human services organizations and nonprofits generally had a couple of issues that they were, well, many issues, but a couple that I'll cover today um, that they were kind of really were the things that were bogging down our work. The first is the workforce. Uh, human services or workers in New York are predominantly paid on government contracts at the city and state level, and they're underpaid for the work that they do. 60% of our workforce qualifies for some form of public assistance. It doesn't mean that they utilize it, but based on their salary ranges, 60% qualify. Um, and they make 20 to 30% less than their peers would make in private industry, whether that's working for government or for health and hospitals uh, or going into private practice. Uh, our providers report 34, 30 to 40% vacancy rates with really high turnover. Um, they find that if they have really skilled workers, that those workers move on to go to government or into the private industry because of those low salaries, um, which is a really big problem for our industry in terms of retaining uh, really talented people. We're also underfunded for the work that we do. Government spends about 80 cents on the dollar for the real cost of services, which has led to real cash flow issues that nonprofits face. Um, about 60% of organizations have three months or less of cash on hand. Uh, and that was a situation uh, going into COVID, uh, which I think is really important because 
nonprofits are at the front lines of this disaster and will be and already are at the front lines of recovery. And if you have entities that are going into that with high vacancy rates, underpaying their staff and not having cash reserves, it's hard to expect them to be able to meet the challenges um, that, that they need to be meeting every day. And so as we walk, as we kind of saw COVID, I mean, I think COVID is an interesting disaster because it uh, slowly came at us and then we're sitting in it and we're doing response work, which is like, how do you respond to the immediate disaster while also doing recovery work, which is how do we get people back on their feet? Um, so it's this weird iterative disaster that it makes it very different than a hurricane or um, you know some sort of like point in time disaster. So our members, we realized there was kind of a life cycle of COVID. The first two weeks was really, what is it? What do we do if it comes to our organization, if a client gets it, if a worker gets it? Then it was kind of, how do we close uh, or not close? How do we operate in this new um, environment where we need to um, human services is really about the touching of people, right? Like bringing people together, in-person counseling, group child care, after school programs, serving seniors, providing socialization. Uh, and so our providers had to look at how to close, how to continue operating something like a residential facility that they couldn't close, um, and how to shift services to make sure that the people that they were serving got the things that they needed. So I think a really important example is in senior services, um, senior centers closed before the rest of the state closed down, understandably, but those seniors still needed health checks and they needed food. Um, and so nonprofits shifted very quickly to doing grab and go meals and then home delivered meals to make sure that people were getting the services that they needed. And then they really focus on how to get to those clients in new ways. Nonprofits have, uh, and I know you're all going to talk about the virtual world today, uh, spent a lot of money on tablets and phones, not just for their workers to work remotely, but so that they could access their clients. Uh, so that kids could get after school programming and tutoring, so that seniors could have kind of virtual wellness checks, uh, and that there was some socialization for people, which I think is really important. And I think something that we didn't really see going into this disaster was uh, how much the internet and the lack of technology that some of us have um, impacts our ability to survive and thrive in a COVID world. Uh, and now we look at reopening. Uh, what does reopening look like? How do we get people back together in safe ways? Um, do we get people back together in safe ways? And also what are some of the lessons that people have learned during COVID that we can embrace uh, and continue to do virtually? I think learning um, how to do telehealth has been a really, I think, um, great thing for the sector uh, to be able to have some of the government regulations around telehealth relaxed so that they could do more wellness checks um, and checking in with people remotely, which is uh, a time saver and a people saver, and also obviously right now, something really important for everyone's health. So as we go into July 1, obviously I think everyone probably, if you're like me, also has a window open about the city budget. Um, we are closely monitoring, this is the last day that the city can put a budget together. Um, the state passed a budget in April with a big old uh, asterisk next to it um, that they will be revisiting it. Um, they announced earlier this week that they're cutting aid to localities uh, for May and June payments 20%. Uh, we see and we will expect that to have a trickle down effect. There will be some cuts in the city budget, um, but I think that's also going to be a rolling budget that's going to be reviewed in the coming months. Um, and so while I think these the two budgets that we have now kind of stave off the worst to human services, and don't quote me on that because the city budget hasn't been printed yet, <laughs> given the deficits, it could be a lot worse. But there's, you know, it's not the only budgets that we're going to have to face. On top of that, kind of some budget cuts that nonprofits are already facing, slowed down payments from the state, potential cuts happening in, in the coming months. Uh, we know that there will be a second wave. I don't think that's any revolutionary thing to say. We have a hot summer where people are going to need heating and cooling. Um, and also, in case you forgot, hurricane season will be on upon us in a couple of months. And that's something we may have to deal with. Um, given how 2020 is going, I think having a hurricane in New York is probably not uh, that far-fetched. And so I think nonprofits also have to think about their emergency planning, about what are they doing to prepare for a second wave? What are they doing to prepare for a heat wave um, and you know, further disasters? So not all bad news. <laughs> nonprofits are really the key to recovery in New York. 
And I know you all spend some time today about taking advantage of a virtual world and how you all have responded to COVID uh, and what your needs are. And I want you to know that the Human Services Council is advocating with our partners every day um, to get the city and state to recognize the importance of the sector. One of those is by staving off some of the worst budget cuts uh, in, in the city and state budgets, um, by asking government to partner with us to really talk about what the needs are of the sector. Um, we know as uh, more than any other disaster, nonprofit human services organizations are the key to the economic recovery of, of the state of New York. Uh, we're gonna see a rise in the need for eviction prevention services. Food access is gonna continue to be a big deal for people who can't leave their homes and need home delivered meals or food pantry access. Uh, New York's not opening without childcare, <laughs> let's be honest. Um, and so people can't go to back to work until we figure out childcare for people. Uh, and there's a myriad of other services that um, this, everyone from all walks of life in the state of New York more than ever before are gonna count on. Um, and as opposed to a localized, like a hurricane or something where um, it's, we need to rebuild houses and uh, get people back on their feet in that way. This is such a um, slow moving and expansive disaster that people are gonna need job training, uh, they're going to need rental assistance. There's just everything that the human services sector brings to New York is going to be needed for this recovery. And we, along with our partners, will, of course, advocate and hope you'll join us in that in making sure the government um, and the foundational sector um, come together to make sure that the sector is supported. And at the same time, as nonprofits yourself, as you go through today, um, and again, thank you to Sarini and Associates for making the space for people um, take the lessons learned from what we've learned in March, which feels so long ago and yet was not that long ago, um, to see how we can utilize this great technology that we've all embraced in the last couple of months that lets me be with you all this morning, um, that lets us access clients in new and interesting ways, uh, and that we take some of what we're learning about the new normal and uh, making our services in the way that we serve New York better. So um, with that, I will leave you. Um, I will say that we, of course, are following the budget closely today. Uh, I know that's like the hot news off the press. And so if we get any updates, uh, we'll make sure that you, you'll be able to see all of that information um, on our website, humanservicescouncil.org, where we also have a number of COVID resources that are accessible to everybody. Um, and I just, again, want to thank Serena and Associates for reaching out to me. I hope you all enjoy the day. Um, while all of your networking opportunities while remote are really important. So thank you all so much and enjoy the rest of your day. All right, so I guess first things first, thank you to Michelle for being our keynote speaker. I know from someone who was uh, involved in the planning with this event, um, we were very excited to have Michelle be able to come and share her knowledge and expertise. I know I heard a lot of great points from her in there. So once again, just thank you to her for uh, volunteering her time to help us out. And thanks to everybody who is coming along here. Um, <laughs> so uh, our notes are, you know, on our presentation, this is based on everything as of June 26th. This is uh, for educational purposes. Um, don't go around trying to use this to combat any SBA or IRS penalties that may result, and this is based on our interpretation of the CARES Act after reviewing the law regulation and other professional guidance. Uh, so all that being said, the PPP loan update. So back in early June, the Congress and was signed by the President passed the Payroll Protection Program Flexibility Act, the PPP FA which brought us probably the most valuable asset we could get outside of the support and money that they provided, which was time. <clears throat> when the PPP first came out, there was a lot of questions as it came to how it was going to work and what was going on, but there was a time crunch. We knew that you had to get in as fast as possible to get the funds and that you needed to use them within an eight week period. Real, real time crunch that we had going on here. The PPPFA bought us time. How did it buy us time? It gave us more weeks to use the money. And in the end, I think that is going to be what one of the lasting legacies of the PPPFA is going to be. Um, new regulations have been issued. The new forgiveness application has been issued out. 
so overall, <clears throat> you know, we're moving along in this process. There are still a lot of unresolved points with this program and the expenses. For a couple of weeks now, we have been hearing that the SBA has been planning to introduce a 30 plus question um, FAQ update, something that was really going to help people better understand what's going on. As a result, I've been kind of hesitant now that I have this newfound time to really push too much out until we knew what was really going on. We still haven't gotten this update. So there's still a lot of questions and we're still uh, ha- you know, looking to get more guidance. There are some maybe who are feeling cynical and beat down that maybe no guidance is coming after this, that we've gotten everything we're going to get and we're going to have to work with what we have. The one reoccurring quote I keep telling everybody, and this applies to me as much as everybody else. The only thing that we're 100% certain on is that no one is 100% certain on anything in this program. So if anybody goes around and says, oh, I 100% know this or that, or I'm the expert and you can trust me and and I'm telling you everything uh, accordingly, That could be, in my estimation, someone that isn't 100% positive. You know, they may not know everything. No one does, trust me. So keep that in mind that everything you read should be taken as with a grain of salt. And you should, you know, take in as much information as you can at any point in time in order to make the best decision possible for your organization. So the PPPFA. The big change here was the expansion of the covered period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. It gave everybody that time I was talking about. The PPPFA lowered the mandatory payroll cost percentage from 75% to 60%. So one confusion I'm continually seeing for many people is that does not mean you have to spend 40% on non-payroll costs. It means that you can spend 40% on non-payroll costs. You can spend 100% on payroll costs if you wanted to. This just allows you to use more of these funds on eligible non-payroll costs. And that change was largely driven from um, lower wage, higher rent, private industries, think like restaurants, that were saying, hey, you know, we need more help with our rent and with our space. I, you know, truly believe that this program and the CARES Act as a whole can best be described as good intentions gone bad. That everybody wants to do the right thing here. Everybody wants to help. And maybe we have made things overly complex rather than um, they needed to be. And that, I think, is, is kind of coming up here as a result. So, um, again, just keep that in mind that this percentage is not have to use. It's a can use provision. It also now allows PPP par- borrowers to defer the employer portion of Social Security tax as allowed under the CARES Act. If you recall to what allowable payroll costs are, one thing not covered is employer federal payroll taxes, meaning Social Security and Medicare. You can cover employer level state payroll taxes, but not employer level federal taxes. The CARES Act did allow for a deferral, but it was only for people who were not taking part in the PPP program. The PPPFA changed that and now allows people who are in the CARES Act or in the PPP loans to defer their payroll taxes. Um, We'll cover a little more on the tax deferral in a few minutes. The other big change in the PPPFA were significant changes to the FTE rules. The FTE rules are a source of controversy, particularly in the nonprofit sector. My general feelings on it that people are 
and I think this comes from all of our shared experiences navigating government programs for so many years, where there's so many tricks and traps and everything is mechanical and not designed, but can go against people in every little way possible that we're so used to that shared experience of so many issues that could pop up. I don't think the PPP FTE calculations are supposed to be as mechanical and rigid as every. I think the PPP as a whole is going to be as mechanical and rigid uh, as maybe we're first interpreting. And I think the FTE rules fall into that as well, where a lot of people are saying, well, December 31st, it's a holiday period. I may not have the same FTEs as I would have and so on and so forth. And and I think that's very much falling into this mechanical, rigid calculation where it's not meant to be. That being said, um, there are significant changes to the FTE rules. The expansion of the FTE safe harbor, that idea that if you bring your hiring back to the level it was as of February 15th by December 31st, 2020, you are in the safe harbor and you don't have any reductions. Well, inside the application and inside the law itself, it expanded to be not later than December 31st, 2020. And I bring that up because it's going to have a little bit of an impact on the forgiveness application going forward. Oh, that's a problem. Uh, There. Um, So um, now on top of the FTE safe harbor change, there are two new safe harbors that employers can uh, avail themselves to. Number one is if you are unable to rehire employees and were unable to hire similarly qualified individuals for unfilled unfilled positions prior to December 31st, 2020, you are able to take advantage of a safe harbor. You will not be considered to have an FTE reduction. A similar thing is in place that if you are in a safe harbor, that an employer cannot return to a similar level of quote unquote business activity as of February 15, 2020, due to compliance with the requirements uh, established by HHS, the CDC, or OSHA by the end of the covered period. So what that really means is if you are practicing social distancing or some other similar, and you were unable to return to a similar level as you were prior to the um, start of this, February 15th is kind of when they're considering the start of this, that you can be in this reduction safe harbor as well. So with these new safe harbors, it sounds like where they're trying to lead us to is putting employers in these safe harbors and not having to worry as much about these mechanical FTE reduction calculations that I think have really driven a lot of the fear and concern for both for-profit and non-profit organizations when it comes to this program. One key point I want to bring up is that um, SBA guidance has indicated that they mean state and local orders to be within compliance of this HHS, CDC, and OSHA items because those orders are based on the HHS and CDC guidelines. So if you think about New York, which is, I'm going to assume, the overwhelming majority of this room, you know, we've had New York on pause, and now we have had the phases kind of phasing in and you know, who knows how long that's going to last, but those orders can be considered to be in compliance with the requirements established by HHS and CDC and allow you to potentially avail yourself to this safe harbor by the end of the covered period. So they're trying, I think, and, and my overall sense of everything that's come out on this PPP program is borrower friendly. Everything has been borrower friendly. Always remember their goal was to give a uh, it was to more or less give a grant that may have to be repaid in the form of a loan. I think if you shift your focus to one that's more similar to organizations of this being a grant 
that may need to be repaid rather than a loan that can be forgiven. I think if you look at it through that lens, it becomes a more familiar item to you. And I think some of your uncertainties may not exist as much as they used to in the past. And it can help you guide overall. Whenever I get lost in the weeds on this, I always go back to, well, what was it they were trying to do? They were trying to give forgivable money to help keep people employed and businesses and organizations going. I guide some of my decisions under that lens very often. Um, finally, with the PPP FA, the loans have a deferral period until 10 months after the end of the covered period. What that really means is you have 10 months after the end of your covered period to apply for forgiveness. We're starting to see forgiveness applications come out. Banks, I know Chase sent one out, I think, yesterday to some uh, borrowers regarding people trying to uh, you know, apply for forgiveness and when they're going to start going there. People are very eager to apply for forgiveness. You don't need to do it right away. You have up until 10 months after the end of the covered period to apply. So we're not, again, on, on this same time crunch table that we were when this program first started. And that time is valuable in so many ways. For loans issued after June 5th, the date of the PPP FA forgiveness, um, they have a five-year maturity. If you recall, most borrowers who were prior to June 5th are going to have the two-year maturity. The loans issued prior to this date can change to the five-year maturity, but only if the lender and borrower mutually agree. Now, I haven't heard of anybody yet trying to change the maturity, I think, because most people are still in the, let me get maximum forgiveness before I worry about anything else. That all being said, I don't know how open banks are going to be to extend the maturity of these things. They are 1% loans that, you know, they have to hold over a certain period. The secondary market for them, which is how banks are typically dispose of these things hasn't been particularly robust according to people I've spoken to who would know this kind of stuff. So I don't know how open banks are going to be about extending the maturity. Maybe they will. I haven't heard anybody trying it yet. So that could just be my uh, relentless cynicism going uh, off here. But just keep that in mind. I don't know if for any unforgiven portion, how open banks are going to be for changing this maturity period. Banks are not particularly known for their um, flexibility and friendliness. So on to the payroll tax deferral. I wanted to, I said I wanted to highlight this. It was originally allowed in the CARES Act for employers to defer, now note the word defer, not eliminate, the employer social security payroll taxes, but it was only for employers who did not get a PPP loan. The IRS and uh, I guess SBA did come out and say that borrowers who got a PPP loan could defer in the period between when they got the loan and when forgiveness began based on their interpretation. However, that seemed like a very high risk proposition for a lot of businesses and organizations, given that you had to remember to turn the clock back on and payroll tax penalties can get very ugly very fast so it just didn't seem like a particularly great thing to do for what amounted to a you know a six or eight week period of payroll taxes that you didn't have to pay the risk reward wasn't there um now that the pppfa allows all employers to defer this it's akin to getting an interest-free loan from the government because you can defer these taxes and it's interest-free, and you'll have to pay 50% by December 31st, 2021, and 50% by December 31st, 2022. So you're really getting an interest-free loan over a, you know, between 18 to 30 month maturity from where we are today that could be, right, will be a lifeline for many organizations as they try to navigate these things. I think cash flow is always at the top of every organization's concern list, and this can really help. Payroll providers are set up for this. Um, it's very, very easy to do. Speak to your specialist. I've done a few of them. I was almost surprised how simple and 
easy all of this was in the end. I was very happy um, that, you know, the simplicity of it all. It made a lot of sense to me. Okay. So now onto the loan forgiveness component. So the application came out back in May. We, you know, poured through that application. We started to develop uh, workbooks, work with a couple software providers to be able to uh, work our way through all of this. Um, they're trying to figure out the best way to do it. And then the PPPFA comes out and changes everything. The new application is out. They have two forms now, the quote unquote long form, which is substantially similar to the application that was provided prior. It does have updates on a couple dollar figure amounts of maximum compensation, so on and so forth, but it's substantially similar to the prior. And the new EZ form that can be used for borrowers that don't have any sort of FTE or salary reduction. Basically, if you're not in a reduction scenario, you can use these forms. There's still a lot of pressure and requests from groups to make the forgiveness itself easier. Uh, I still hold out hope, naive hope it may be at this point that loans below a certain dollar threshold will just get automatic forgiveness. Don't know if that's gonna happen or not at this point, but at this point, I'm hoping. Um, with the 24 weeks, employee cash compensation limit is increased to 56,154. That's how much you can pay any individual employer in, employee in cash compensation. This includes all forms of compensation, bonuses, stipends, commissions, whatever, retro pay, whatever you may want to use for compensation, this can be used. And it is for compensation that is paid or incurred. Very crucial point here. We were at first not sure how this was going to work, but it's been made clear in the regulations, in the applications, is for compensation that is paid or incurred. So if you pay it in the period accounts, if you incur it and pay it by your next regular payroll cycle, it counts. So it gives you a lot of leeway. The measurement date, the FTE Safe Harbor measurement date, it is the earlier of December 31st, 2020, or the date your application is submitted. Note how when I said the PPPFA changed the safe harbor date. The application indicates that it is the earlier of these two dates. So if you are at a point after your covered period is up that you have reached an <clears throat> FTE safe harbor amount, that may be a good time to do your application because you can now apply to this safe harbor because it is earlier than December 31st, but when you submit your application. <clears throat> Payroll processors, think ADP, think Paychex, Paycor, et cetera, um, are working on reports to help streamline this. And it's been stated in the regulations that lenders and borrowers can generally rely on those. So, you know, we need to give them as much time as we all need to work their way through this and provide us with the reports that we need. I am looking forward to them coming out, hopefully making this process so much easier on borrowers. So for loan forgiveness, you can apply at any point prior to the end of the covered period. You could apply today if you wanted to. Doesn't mean that you should. Doesn't even mean that your bank is going to accept it today. In fact, I'm gonna say banks probably aren't. Um, practically speaking, we are unaware of any banks that are. The documentation requirements seem to indicate that a second and potentially third quarter payroll tax return may be required. The second quarter payroll tax returns aren't due yet. As a matter of fact, second quarter payroll tax period ends today. So you're going to be way ahead if you try to apply. So I wouldn't really worry about that. Um, an organization can theoretically, quote unquote, spend away any FTE reduction. So the more time you have, the more opportunity you have to incur PPP eligible costs. The earlier application doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, it's a risk reward calculation here. As far as I'm concerned, the reward of waiting and getting more and more spend, more PPP spend into my covered period, 
the more likely I am to hit maximum forgiveness, whether, you know, I have an FTE reduction or not, or my calculation of FTE isn't the same as the banks. Well, if I have enough spend to kind of cover that, it works away. And like I said, still hoping for a further streamlining or blanket forgiveness. My hope's running out, though. Um, last week is on some uncertainties, and then we'll spend a few minutes on the EIDL program. Um, if you've been to any of our prior webinars, if you've spoken with Ken or I or uh, other industry groups, there are still uncertainties when it comes to the interactions with government-funded agencies and deficit-funded agencies and the PPP. Uh, um, there's a concern of double funding and, you know, people getting a greater benefit than they should. We're taking the approach generally that there should be no double funding, but each organization will need to look at their individual facts and circumstances as it comes to that. On retirement contributions, get this question a lot. The application indicates, quote unquote, paid for employer contributions to employee retirement plans. So the popular question is, what if I have a uh, accrued retirement pension oblig uh, or retirement obligation due from my 2019 calendar year or my 2019 fiscal year that I've still yet to pay or I pay in my covered period, would that count? We don't have anything clear on that, but what, what the applicant says it could be very well be possible. I would love to see more guidance on that. I wouldn't necessarily have that be, this is my idea about spend away. If I have more costs, maybe I don't need to worry about this problem as much. So keep that in mind. But, you know, there still haven't been a lot of guidance on these retirement contributions. Unemployment insurance. Many nonprofits are having to do the reimbursement uh, as they have historically, but that's starting to add up. Now we know there's supposed to be a 50% relief from the federal government. Still kind of waiting to see how that's going to work. Um, you know, they've given some guidance on it, but to me, something doesn't work until I actually see dollars in hand. You know, I can conceptually hear a lot of things, but let's see dollars in hand. Uh, a question I'm getting a lot recently is on health insurance has been does this, does this include dental and vision? Under tax law, these are generally treated as health insurance, but the ACA did not consider these to be health insurance. So nothing definitive has been said either way on these. I, again, have the same thing that I was discussing before. If I have uncertainties and I'm able to put more into my certain costs, I don't have to deal with these problems as much. And that's why I'm saying the time is helpful on that 24 weeks. I can spend away a lot of my problems. So now let's go on to the economic injury disaster loans. These are the traditional SBA relief programs during disasters. They ran out of funding uh, early on, but were replenished as part of round two. The SBA has been to their credit Working through these applications a lot quicker than I had anticipated that they would. Organizations are still able to apply for funding on this. Um, for a while, applications were limited to agricultural concerns. Uh, that has since been removed. So you are able to apply for funding through this program. It is a strict, uh, streamlined, a quick, streamlined application. Uh, basically requires information on gross receipts in organizations, your gross support, and your cost of operations. It's a very, very quick process. The loans themselves are being limited to $150,000 maximum. Now, the program said up to $2 million. I've seen enough of them go out now. I've read enough of this to know that they are capping them at $150,000. And I think the intention there is to spread the wealth and get as many to as many people as possible. The SBA underwriting is on a presumed economic injury, which is typically four times your monthly gross profit um, under NFPs. This would indicate your direct operating costs is what they're looking for based on older SBA guidance. I haven't seen anything definitive on newer SBA, but that comes from some older presentations from three or four years ago. Based on the applications I've seen, I still believe that to be the case. These are 
all 30-year loans at a 2.75% interest rate. Um, if you calculate the amortization, that's a payment of $612.36 after a 12-month deferral. I believe because some interest accrues during that deferral, the payments on the loan documents I've actually seen has been an even $641. So just keep that in mind. There is a slight difference between those two. Um, the loan still included the language for collateral in assets. Uh, in the case of the borrower will not dispose of collateral without SBA approval. They required hazard insurance, at least 80% of the loan value, and requires the borrower to provide financial statements to the SBA within three months of year end. These are all in your loan docs if you have one. Not many people have spoken about this. Um, borrowers also need to submit a board resolution from the board of directors regarding this loan within 180 days. So finally, when you talk about the use of how you're going to use these, I find it easier to say what you really can't use them for versus what you can use them for. You can't use it for expansion, growth, or to refinance your other debt. You can use these loans for the proceeds solely uh, as working capital, meaning accounts payable, rent, any currently due debt payments, principal and interest, and any payroll not covered by the PPP. The borrower will have to maintain receipts, invoices for all loan funds for up to three years after being spent. So that being said, thank you for your time. I believe Lula has sent out information regarding uh, the next two tracks. I apologize for any audio uh, delays. I will be hopping into the networking room for a few minutes if anybody wants to have conversations when it comes to this. Um, thank you very much for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of our seminar.